Hey everyone, my name is Josh. I'm a PhD candidate in uh, political science at the University of Michigan. Um, really uh, pleased to be part of this conference and thank you so much um, for allowing us to present this work. This is a paper that I've been working on with my colleague Jack Lana, who's at the University of Cardiff. Um, we both study political behavior, political psychology, um, and in this paper we're looking at um, attitudes around uh, deservingness of welfare for people with disabilities and the interaction between that um, and ethnicity and how these different attributes and characteristics of people with disabilities shape um, their perception that they're deserving of welfare. So I'm going to jump straight into the motivation and the theory behind this paper and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, the experiments that we ran. So to kind of set the problem up, uh, in the UK today, um, most recent figures estimate that around 18% of people identify as disabled, so a very significant proportion of the population. Um, this subset of the UK population is disproportionately living in poverty, jobless and underemployed, and more likely to report being lonely, um, and more likely to report low, le low levels of political efficacy and higher levels of social alienation. So the normative urgency of providing financial resources to people with disabilities is very significant even today, even in highly developed uh, democracies. So one of the big findings in the welfare literature is that people with disabilities are considered to be sort of among the most deserving of welfare recipients. So there's a lot of sort of survey literature that asks about uh, which groups are the most deserving of assistance and people with disabilities are right up there with sort of the elderly and people who are sick. Um, but at the same time, there's a bit of a contradiction in that they face a lot of barriers to access as well. So even though people with disabilities are considered deserving, uh, there's a lot of institutional barriers to them getting the financial resources they need. There's sort of hierarchies of more and less deserving people with disabilities. Um, there are sort of requirements to prove clinical um, extents of impairments. Um, and there's also sort of hostile and negative public attitudes towards people who don't sort of live up or match up to disability stereotypes. So people with more invisible impairments, um, people with um, people who sort of, yeah, don't embody disabilities, disability stereotypes as neatly. Uh, they're often subject to sort of hostile public attitudes. Um, so basically in this paper, we want to argue that the perceived deservingness of disabled people that's such a, a firm feature of the existing literature is actually more conditional than previously acknowledged. Uh, to do this, we draw on sort of two literatures, some insights from two literatures. Uh, first is the welfare attitudes literature, and the second is the stereotype content literature um, in sort of social, social and cognitive psychology. So uh, who deserves help? A uh, big finding in the welfare attitudes literature is that um, if you want to if, if you want to find out whether people support a welfare program, you ask them whether it, whether the recipients are deserving or not. So, what kinds of people deserve help? Well, the two there are a lot of criteria that go into uh, deservingness of welfare assistance, but perhaps the two most important are control and identity. So, those basically refer to the degree of control that a potential welfare potential welfare recipient has over their, their circumstances um, and then their identity. So their identity, like whether they are a member of my community, my in-group, um, my sort of nation or ethnicity. So people who are closer to me in group terms, closer to my identity, are more likely to be seen as deserving of help. Um, and people who are less in control of their circumstances are also more likely to be seen as deserving of assistance. So if you're seen as lazy, um, you're going to be undeserving. If you're seen as kind of helpless or in a situation that you can't control, you're more likely to be seen as deserving. Uh, a lot of these insights in the literature haven't been applied specifically to disability yet, though. So we have a lot of studies that examine identities like ethnic group identities, uh, migrant status, uh, unemployment, even sort of moral characteristics. Um, and all of these things readily intersect with, uh, with, with disability, um, but we haven't sort of had a whole lot of research on disability per se. Um, so in multicultural de democracies, understanding the interaction between disability and other social identities has a lot of implications, we argue, for, for policy, the way that policy is framed and communicated to people. And, um, and we think that uh, there needs to be more research on exactly how people respond to uh, people with disabilities. Um, and so we, we particularly look here at the interaction between ethnicity, um, and to, to a lesser extent, um, migrant status um, and disability in this paper. So a lot of these uh, insights about um, 
uh, sort of deservingness and the determinants of deservingness cohere with uh, some other findings from psychology about disability stereotypes. And we kind of uh, blend these two literatures together. Um, so basically in the stereotype content literature, people with disabilities are stereotyped as high in warmth and low in competence. And this helps explain uh, in part or put a framework around why they're sort of considered deserving of, deserving of assistance. So people with disabilities are stereotyped as warm, so friendly and cooperative, um, relationally accessible, but then like low in competence. And competence is associated with social status and personal efficacy and skill and intelligence and things like that. So these are the, the stereotypes that characterize people with disabilities. And these stereotypes in this literature they've shown are associated with pity as an emotion, pity and sympathy, um, which is related. Pity is an emotion that you feel to someone you perceive to be beneath you. So it's quite a uh, condescending emotion. But that's also associated with a willingness to help. So these, these disability stereotypes um, behaviorally manifest in a willingness to provide assistance. So that manifests, one of the ways that that manifests is in a willingness to provide welfare or a perceived deservingness of welfare. The other feature of uh, disability stereotypes that we isolate in the paper is that um, disability isn't really differentiated ethnically. So um, when people think about someone with a disability, they usually don't think of a person of a particular race. They're most likely to just think of someone of the same ethnicity as them. And that's because disability is a human universal. It, um, you know, for, for millennia, it's, it's shown up in every human community. And so uh, it's not ethnically differentiated. But we know in the welfare literature that um, both kind of a sense of responsibility for one's circumstances and people with disabilities are seen as not responsible for their circumstances and uh, sort of uh, ethnic identity and in-group identity more generally are seen as important determinants of welfare. So from this, we go into more detail in this, uh, in, on this in the paper, but we derive this, uh, this argument that disabled people who are perceived as responsible for their impairment or as more group distant will be seen as counter-stereotypic based on this framework and therefore less deserving of welfare assistance. So I'm going to go into some more specific hypotheses and then uh, the design of our experiments. So uh, we derive three main hypotheses and these are related to deservingness. So valuations of deservingness will decrease as responsibility for impairment increases, perceived responsibility for impairment increases. Evaluations of deservingness will be lowest in the high responsibility and outgroup condition. And evaluations of deservingness will be highest in the low responsibility and ethnic in-group condition. So our empirical strategy, we, can we conducted uh, two vignette experiments in the recent uh, Welsh and Scottish election studies. Uh, these included nationally representative samples that were recruited by YouGov and we pre-registered the studies at aspredicted.org. We use a two by three factorial design, which has two ethnicity conditions and three impairment conditions. And I'll go a little bit uh, more into exactly what we do. So study one was in the Welsh election study. Uh, we included a, a fairly uh, strong manipulation check that had a very high success rate, but we, so we dropped respondents who failed the manipulation check. Um, basically what we did was randomly assign respondents to one of six vignettes describing a fictitious male subject with an acquired brain injury. So we have two ethnicity conditions. So in the first condition, um, the, the subject is named David and lives in Cardiff. And in the second ethnic, ethnicity condition, uh, they're named Khaled and they're a migrant from Wales who emigrated to Wales as a child, from, from Yemen who emigrated to Wales as a child. And there's an example vignette um, here uh, at the bottom. And there's three impairment conditions. So the three impairment conditions are, in the first, it's... Uh, the, the subject acquires their impairment at birth uh, due to complications with childbirth. In the second impairment condition, the subject acquires their impairment uh, in a motorbike accident. And then in the third impairment condition, this is the one you see at the bottom here, uh, the subject acquires their injury um, uh, through illicit drug use. So obviously that's the highest responsibility, uh, highest perceived responsibility uh, manipulation. So we have two main outcome variables. The first is kind of a check of whether our manipulation worked um, as planned. So to what extent do you think David slash Carl was responsible for their injury? And the second is related to deserving this. So to what extent do you think David slash Carl deserves some financial assistance from the government? And then we include some additional measures in some of the regression models that we run. So I'll present the main effects and I'll, pre and I'll present 
um, a regression model that we ran, uh, highlighting some of the um, relative effects of these variables. So the first set of main effects, responsibility for injury. As you can see, the manipulation pretty much worked as we expected. Uh, we did have a couple of funny results. So um, we have uh, an interesting ethnicity result in that color is slightly less responsible, seen as slightly less responsible, and these are all significant in the motorbike and drugs conditions and slightly more responsible in the birth condition. Uh, we didn't really have any hypotheses about that and we're not totally sure uh, what's driving that, but there's clearly an ethnicity effect, effect going on there. Um, but as you'll see soon, that, that diminished responsibility in the motorbike and drugs conditions isn't really reflected uh, in deserving this evaluations. So this is the responsibility for injury. And then here we have the deservingness of assistance results. So these are just the main effect results. So we have a clear effect of the control cues uh, impacting deservingness evaluation. So um, it's kind of hard to get a sense of, of exactly uh, the, the magnitude of these effects or the size of those differences, but they are uh, very substantial. The p-values are uh, vanishingly small, partly because we have a large sample. Um, but basically we can see here as perceived control or responsibility for impairment increases, perceived deservingness decreases. Um, and in the motorbike and drugs condition, Carlet is, is not significantly, uh, is, is significantly less responsible, but this isn't reflected in deserving, so he's not significantly less deserving. Um, and contrary to expectation, this is the weird result um, that we kind of would love to get some feedback on. Carlin is seen as less deserving in the birth condition um, than even he is in the motorbike condition and certainly is uh, a lot less deserving than David in the birth condition. Um, we have a couple of theories about what's driving this. Um, it seems like a highly punitive response to Carlin in this condition. Um, what I think could be driving it, uh, what we think could be driving it is that in the absence of a kind of behavioral cue, which is to say like in the absence of, Dave, of, of Khaled engaging in a behavior like riding a motorbike or taking illicit drugs, um, because there isn't that behavioral cue, uh, that might be resulting in uh, like a greater emphasis on the identity cue. Um, but as I said, we're not totally sure and we'd love to get some, some feedback on that. So this is the regression model to give you a sense of uh, the size of these effects relative to um, some other variables that we threw in. Um, so uh, we are reporting standardized beta coefficients here, which allow for a bit of a needy comparison because the scales are quite variable on some of these. The, the scales are quite, um, uh, like there's a lot of different size scales on these variables. Um, but yeah, as you can see here, basically the name Q in uh, the birth condition is of a similar magnitude to some of the ideology, uh, some of the ideology cues, um, and particularly this liberal authoritarian values um, variable. So similar magnitude there, um, but uh, still no significant effect on ethnicity for uh, either the motorbike or the drugs conditions uh, when we, when we uh, run the regression model. So study two. Uh, study two aimed to address some of the puzzles that we identified in study one. So study two we ran in the 2021 Scottish election study, uh, similar sam uh, slightly smaller sample, but also nationally representative. Um, and basically the design was a direct replication of study, study one, but we softened the ethnicity queue and made it a name only ethnicity queue, which is quite common in a lot of exposure studies that um, examine race as a, as a treatment variable. So here's an example of... Uh, the uh, treatment vignette for this, uh, for Khaled in this experiment. Um, all the outcome variables and controls are measured identically to study one, um, and we dropped the don't know responses from the models, which we also did in study one. I don't think I noted that. Um, so here are the main effects for study two, and they're a little bit more uniform. So responsibility for injury, there are no real significant dis uh, differences by ethnicity, and we still have that um, that, that sort of strong stepwise relationship across each of the impairment conditions. So manipulation worked as expected and uh, with, with fewer ethnic differences than in, in study one. Deservingness of assistance, uh, similar results though there were, uh, yeah, similar results to, uh, to study one. 
um, though we obviously don't see um, the difference in the birth by ethnicity in the birth condition that we saw in study one, um, which is what we predicted would happen. So I guess from that, we can infer that the migrant queue in study one is doing a lot of work there. Um, and that could be related to, I mean, the, the literature on welfare attitudes would suggest that that's uh, an intuitive result, but it still is hard to reconcile with the results across some of the other impairment categories. Like, why don't we see that result in the other impairment categories? So we're still sort of trying to work to wrap our heads around that one. But in any case, a little bit more uniform in the results here, although we do have a significant ethnicity effect in the birth condition and in the drugs condition here. So um, the birth condition... Uh, both of the, um, yeah, there's a significant difference between David and Carla in both of those treatments, but not in the motorbike condition. And that could be related to um, dropping the don't know uh, results from, from, that, from that particular condition. Um, but here's that expressed in an OLS. So as you can see here, um, at the very top of the model, uh, we have significant results for ethnicity in uh, in the regression format. Um, and the results for uh, ideology and liberal and authoritarian values are a little bit more predictable as well. So uh, on the previous on the previous regression model we had um, uh, the birth injury was uh, the birth injury injury kind of primed a stronger sort of liberal authoritarian, uh, opposition, but we don't see that in this model, which is kind of what we expected. So that's the second uh, set of results. Just to wrap up, um, we still have a lot more to do on this project and it's very much in its early stages. So we really look forward to getting feedback from you guys. Uh, we want to do a little bit more digging into some of these don't know responses in the, um, particularly in DV1, to what extent do you think David slash Carla was responsible for their injury? So we might rerun some of our regression models with, uh, with those don't know responses included. We're also interested in getting some feedback and thoughts on some of the potential psychological mechanisms behind these observe, observed effects. So there appears not to be this a very direct relationship between responsibility and deservingness. Um, so we're interested in what might be mediating that relationship. So we see that kind of neat stepwise um, kind of jump in the in the responsibility variable, but we don't see that in the deservingness variable. So there's clearly something mediating that um, and we're, we're interested in what that could be. Um, as I said, um, still very uh, still very early stages, so we're looking looking forward to hearing everyone's feedback. And thanks again so much for for having us and letting us present this work.